and gentlemen, the three knockdown rule on Triller is in effect. I'm Steve Kim, joined by Mario Lopez. And Mr. Lopez, we have a very, very special in-studio guest. So special, I don't even get a moniker this week, so I'll just get right to him. My man, Doug Fisher yeah. from Ring Magazine. Thank Bible you for having me. Thank you. The, the editor extraordinaire. Quick shout out, Smoking Tim uh, Frazier, Buffalo Knuckles, and Tino. Tino on the edits. There's a lot to talk about. The April schedule is very busy. Let's get into it because Doug's going to help us break this down and preview what we're going to see in the upcoming weeks. Doug, you have a busy job as the editor. April 9th on a Saturday. This is what we have. On the zone, early in the morning, rise and shine. I think it's going to be like 5 o'clock in the morning. Gennady Golovkin is going to take on Ryuto Murata. Wow, I'm down for a daytime fight. You know I like those because oh, day morning. is my that's favorite. Early but that's early morning. But I'll, I'll get up for them. For this matchup, yes. And, and the co-featured bout. with the Junto, Junto Nakatani. Nakatani. Yes, Bonsai. That, wow. I, I, I love that guy. That is I mad win. early. So the Japanese clearly don't care about the American audience that much. <laughs> yeah. They don't need it with that superstar. Right. Also, on ESPN, later that night, Michaela Mayer takes on Jennifer Hahn. Then on The Zone, the return of Ryan Garcia takes on Emmanuel here or to go. And then on Showtime, Erickson Lubin takes on Sebastian Fonduro. So, Doug, as the editor, how do you dole out the assignments on this particular There's night? somebody for each of those shows, definitely. Um, and I might cover one of them, you know, but I'm from TV. I'm not flying to Saitama, Japan. Um Orange County's not too far. Maybe I could do that. Um, but, you know, the fight that I'm really looking forward to is is that junior middleweight matchup. No title on the line, but those are two legit young up-and-coming contenders in the 154-pound division. I think uh, Erickson Lubin is either number four or number five rated by Ring Magazine, and Fandora is either number five or number six. I, I like to see those type of matchups. I love that matchup. I'm probably more excited about that, to be honest with you, for those very reasons. I can't pick a winner. And I can't figure out how the styles play out because Erickson Lubin, he, Lubin is like a, a stalking southpaw, like boxer puncher. And Fondora is just so freakishly tall and gangly, but he seems durable and, and he he's does, a volume puncher. And he like, does how it, does that work? He doesn't utilize his assets, I think, really, right? Because he's not, his height and his reach, he likes to fight inside, he likes to throw a lot. He's been effective and make, that's what makes it fun, though. It's a fun fight to he's watch. He's the tallest, shortest fighter I've ever seen. Yeah. And Lubin, it's it's interesting. When 2017, he took on one of the Charlos, he wasn't ready for it. Yeah, that was it, Jamel. Yeah, and he got knocked out and won. That's one of the great scenes. Previous the year, he's Ring Magazine's prospect of the year, hmm. but he was like, 20, 21? It was too soon. Too yeah, much too if soon. both guys were of equal height, I think Lubin is definitely the favorite. But again, size and height matter. But you you remember Paul Paul Williams, yes, right? He of fought a southpaw. He first he he beat Antonio Margarito for the WBO welterweight belt. And people are saying this guy is is he's untouchable because he's just too tall, throws too many punches, and he's tough. And then he fights this southpaw. Louis Colazzo. No, it wasn't Colazzo. Yeah. It was it was a dude from Puerto Rico. I can't think of his name. Quintana. Quintana. Carlos Quintana. Yes, Carlos, Carlos Quintana. Quintana. Very good. I and remember Quintana that. And Quintana, just he got low and just timed him with these overhand lefts. From the mid-range. And so did um, uh, Eris so Landy Lara when no. he fought right. uh, or Williams. It, and I wonder if, if Erickson can do the same. Well, Sergio Martinez, who's not a southpaw, of course, but that beautiful overhand right is one of the best oh, knockouts, right. I think. I think of that era. And guys, what do we know about... Here's the thing that gets me. Rita Morata is the relative unknown to American audiences. Golovkin's the mystery. What version of does does the Triple G exist in 2022? I have no clue. Well, he's he's turning 40. April 8th. He's, yeah, he's literally fight. turning 40 the day before the fight. Now he looks good. His camp in Florida, all, all the video and the photos you see, his body is immaculate. He's got a nice tan. He's more <laughs> um like lean right. than I've ever seen him, but I wonder if that's a good thing at his age. You, you know, you're always going to be a question mark when you get over like 35, 36, yeah, 37. And you've been, and he's been at the same weight all these years. Marvin Hagler he's, style. Yeah, and he's had some tough fights. Um, now, Morata's right there to be hit. He stands straight up, wades right in, but he is, he's big, he's strong, and he attacks the body. It's going to. I think there's a window of opportunity for Murata if he starts hard. I agree because Golovkin, too, uh, has a style that isn't built necessarily for the long run. And he also had, like, literally hundreds of amateur fights. So there's At a lot. 350? Crazy. So there's a lot of wear and tear there. And I, I love me some Triple G, but... At 40, we're going I'm curious to see what version we get. Mario, it's like that fancy classic car, the 57 Chevy that looks great, 
got the armor all going, got the turtle wax. It looks pristine. You don't take those cars out on a long road trip. That's for around the block, maybe Whittier right. Boulevard on a Sunday. That's what Golovkin looks like because his body, as he said, looks great. He's out of Big Bear training non-altitude, which I right. believe needed to happen for That's a couple probably of a years. Good thing. Yeah. Uh, uh, and he's got a lot of incentive right now because obviously if he wins, then he's in line to fight he, uh, Canelo for a major payday. Right. He's st- I mean, he's fighting Murata in Japan. Murata is the superstar in his homeland. But the odds favorite is, is Triple G. Am, am I am I right or wrong? Yes. It's, yes. And and he's the media favorite, right? Yes. I don't I, I don't know of anyone picking the upset special. Bottom line is, if Golovkin really wants to whet the appetite and have all of us excited about the third chapter with Canelo, you got to end this. Mm. Well, he can't just end win. This. He has to impress. dominate and maybe even score a stop. Yeah, that's the best commercial for a, a third bout with Canelo. And I'll say this. He's still Ring Magazine's number one rated middleweight for a reason. The dude has still has an elite level jab, and when uh, this Very dude jab. Steve Rolls recently went ten rounds with, with Berlanga, Berlanga, I went back and watched Golovkin's fight with Steve Rolls, and I was kind of hard on him at the time, you know, because I didn't know anything about Steve Rolls. But when he, the way he put away Rolls reminded me that this dude is an elite boxer. He had the perfect punch. For every occasion, like he yeah. knew, he knew the right punch to throw at the right time, and it landed in the right place. Southpaw stance. He did yeah. the shift. Yeah. yeah, he still has that selection. He still has that elite level jab. He can still tap the body when he wants to. Yeah. I, I favor Golovkin. You know, no one cuts off the ring like uh, like Golovkin. Too great timing. Well, well he, he doesn't have to look for this cat. Yeah. Right, <laughs> Mario. You've actually spoken to Ryan Garcia and Joe Goose, and you said you had a short conversation about a week and a half ago. What are you expecting on April 9th? They both seem very confident in this camp. They like the way. Uh, it's going. You know, we love some. Uh, we love us some Joe Goose. The denim dynamo. And he uh, wig is looking tight as ever. Always, always. He says they've been having a solid camp. I find that ironic that they remained in San Diego, not that far from Canelo's camp uh, either. But you know, from what I'm hearing so far, so good. And I know uh, uh, De La Hoya and, and Gomez went down there recently too to check up on him. So all reports back is that it's going well. But obviously, we'll see when uh, the day comes. Yeah, so we'll see. Uh, one thing I do like is that Joe Goosen is actually doing the pad, and yeah, they're doing yeah. some heavy bag work. It's not just that 88-punch combination he also likes a lot or of the sparring. Cobra bag on the mitts. So right. I want to see if there's any changes. We haven't seen him in a while. Um, he should be to go. There's a reason why they chose him. Moving forward, April 16th on Showtime pay-per-view for a welterweight unification, three belts on the line. Errol Spence takes on Ordenis Ugas from Arlington, Texas. Doug, let's make this clear. The Ring Magazine belt, it is not eligible for this particular it bout. It isn't. It could have been. It could have been on the line if the Ring Ratings panel would have okayed it before Terrence Crawford beat Sean Porter. Because hmm. at, at one time, Errol Spence was the number one rated contender and Ordenis Ugas was number three. And in some occasions, a vacant ring magazine title can be on the line with the blessing of the ratings panel when number one fights number three. But then the number two contender, which was Bud Crawford, he looked so good against Sean Porter, the, the ratings committee elevated him to number one. So now what we have with this unification fight, still an awesome matchup. You have Sp- Spence at number two and Ugas at number three. So let me ask the, you, the ring title remains vacant. And I think that's for the best because if the ring title was on the line without Terrence Crawford being a part of that picture, it'd be a lot of unhappy fans. It'd be a lot. They, they'd be a, a large contingent of the boxing industry that just sort of shake their head like, no, yeah. no, no. I, you can't call yourself the real champion until you <laughs> fight until you fight Bud Crawford. And I get that. And I believe Whoever holds the Ring Magazine title is the real champion. I agree with you in respect for, for making that decision. I think that was a smart move, and, and that's why it's so um, respected and, and, and reputable. Assuming Spence gets past um, Ugas. That's not way, a given. Which, by the way, I was just about to say that. Not it's a not given, necessarily no. a given. That That's a really good fight. Ugas is feeling himself now. Oh, yeah. And difficult and he's style. A, and he's a solid fighter. Yeah. Um, But let's assume for a second he does. Do you think the fight with Crawford and him finally does happen? I think there's a good chance because what else? What, what other fight can be made? What what else is Errol Spence going to do, and what else is Terence Crawford going to do? I, that's what I say. Neither I, guy has any options. They're they're both out of options unless they step up to 154. I certainly hope so because then Steve Kim finally goes out his sideburns. 
That was no, the it bet. has to happen by June. Is that July? the bet? No, no, no not, not June, that... July. It was his calendar year, you rat bastard. No, no, it was yes, it was. No, oh, it was. It don't post. start. Bent. He got his Earl Shy yeah. and he's backtracking. <laughs> no, you're lying. Continue though. Your Dennis, get that jab going. Get that jab going and move. listen to Ismail Salas. By the way, Ismail Salas, I think, is a key factor. Very underrated. How trainer. do I judge a great trainer? How many fights do you win as an underdog? There's no Salas. All the damn time. Does it all the time. It's all easy. around the world. It's easy to have the 10 to 1 favorite and keep racking up victories. Sure. This guy He doesn't get credit, the, though. No, he's too he's, quiet. Yeah. Maybe he's too short. Does, I don't know what the does, deal is. He actually wears heels. Yeah, I know. Shoes those to those are hilarious. Yeah, those high tops. Yeah. Yeah. But, but, my guy rocks platforms. platforms. He, has like, yeah. he has like Chuck Taylor yeah. high tops with like platforms because he's so short when he works. Yeah, when he does Is that right? Props to him. I like that. No, but here's the here's a factor in this fight. Um... How many times has Errol Spence fought in like the last two years? Once? Once or twice. Yeah. Last fight Danny was Danny Garcia, Garcia, December of 2020. Yeah. Keep Ooh. that in mind. And he's also coming a off a detached retina. And that eye, I think, is right in line of that lead left jab of Ugas. These so, are factors. Interesting. So, so Ugas, live dog. Yes. Oh, definitely. Very yes. live dog here. Definitely. Yes. As if I was a betting man. Huh. Mm, hmm. Yeah, the odds are with you. <laughs> also, April 23rd on ESPN pay-per-view from jolly old England. WBC heavyweight title is on the line. Tyson Fury takes on Dillian White. Gentlemen, I just want to say one thing. To Dillian White and his team and his lawyers. Guys, you signed the contract. You're getting a lot of money. I'm sick and tired of the bitching and moaning. And people think, is he going to show up? Bro, you're getting $8 million. You've wanted this heavyweight shot for three, four years. Yeah. Win the fight. Parlay that. Am yeah. I wrong? You've been crying about the WBC title. Well, Tyson Fury is Ring Magazine champion and WBC champion. He's the biggest star. He's the biggest heavyweight, literally and figuratively, figuratively speaking, yes. in the world. This is your shot. It's happening in the UK. It's arguably the biggest UK championship bout of all time. Play your part, man. What, what could it be? Complaining Rise about the damn now, occasion. Though. What is there to complain about now? I don't know, but he's, he's being he's being salty as far as the promotion goes. Well, this this came about because they weren't happy with the purse bid uh, purse bid percentage. He thought he should have been closer to forty to forty five percent. Well, at instead. one time he had the WBC's interim title. But I don't know if he still has right. that. Right. Then he get knocked out by Povetkin in their first that fight. Did and that did happen. Of, right. <laughs> and so, and the other thing is, look, part of your job, and this is where boxing falls behind, in other sports, if you're in a Super Bowl, they make you do media. He refused to show up to his press conference. And I'm thinking, you're not really helping yourself. Not that of it matters. Not. But let's hope. Uh, yeah. I mean, didn't it sell out in like right. 10 minutes or something right. like that? That's there, Here's a, one thing I'll say about that. You know, the, the promotion could be better because, you know, you don't have both guys cooperating. But once they step into the ring, there's a lot of personality in that ring. And I think it's actually a pretty good style matchup because Dillian White is an aggressive boxer puncher. Long reach, pretty good jab. He can bomb with that left hook. He goes to the body pretty well. So I don't think Tyson Fury can afford to sleep on this dude. No, yeah. I don't think so either. And Hearn seems very confident about White's chances. I don't know if he's just promoting, but... If you look at Dillian White's resume, it's actually top five. He's faced more good heavyweights and won his share fights. He's battle-tested for sure. Battle-tested, absolutely. Then finally, April 30th, dueling shows on ESPN from the MGM Grand Junior Lightweight Unifications on the line. Oscar Valdez takes on Shakur Stevenson. Mm. Then on the zone from the famed Madison Square Garden, Katie Taylor takes on Amanda Serrano. Look, I'm going to be honest with you. I'm going to be at the MGM Grand. Stevenson, Valdez, that's my focus this night. I'm going to be at Madison Square Garden. What? Hey. Oh, really? I, I, I like Katie Taylor. I like Amanda Serrano. It's for all the marbles in the Women's Lightweight Championship. Ring Magazine titles on the line. Ah, there's an okay. undercard bout where there's a, a vacant... <laughs> Ring Magazine title on the line. That's uh, also a married man medals. talking, Kim. Mm. <laughs> married man talking. Get a time out from the well, family. Go to I New York. Think, you know, <laughs> That's been a, it's, it's been too long. <laughs> sure, sure. Long. I, I miss Jimmy's corner. But hey. I think it, it's probably going to be like the biggest women's world title fight in the history of, of No doubt about that. Wow. I, 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 Bold I think, statement. I think, I think they're going to sell out. I think they're actually going to oh, sell good, out. Oh, that's good then. The that's great. Arena. We'll see. I don't know if it's officially sure. sold out yet, but I think it's going to be a live atmosphere. And I actually think it's going to be a good fight. Because Taylor brings it. it. Sure. Serrano is, she's going to have the, the, the Puerto Rican pride backing right. her. She's going to have the, the New York fans on her side. Taylor brings a lot of fans uh, to, to that storied arena. Um, they're both aggressive. They're both come forward fighters, uh, even though Serrano is really a natural featherweight. I think she has the heavier hands. I think Katie Taylor's got the fast feet. 
and the fast combinations. Also, good co-feature. Liam Smith takes on Jesse Vargas. That'll be fun. Oh, that's a good fight right there. Battle. No, I agree. I think women's boxing has had a bit of a renaissance this year. There's been some some really solid fights, so I hope they're able to um, capitalize on that and and, uh, end on a great note. The Stevenson-Valdez fight, is a fun fight, obviously, with the the Battle of Styles um, going on right there. But, man, Stevenson... Tremendous matchup. I think Stevenson's just um, such a talented kid, and it's going to be so hard. I strongly favor Shakur. Most people fight. do. That's the yeah. consensus opinion. It's just yeah. a matter of styles to me. Yeah, and I think he's... It, I, it just everything's clicking right now. He's... And his physical uh, prime, he's just so focused. He shot the confidence. Those fast twitch muscles are at their twitchiest. Yeah, and he's grown into his body. Yeah, he's I mean, that's a tough— I feel like he could step up and be a top lightweight right now. Yeah, I know. I, I he could challenge any lightweight out there, any of the top five lightweights. I mean, look at what I, he did to and Nakatila. He'd be, he'd be live. He no. made Nakatila a non-factor. I agree. Yeah. I mean, Shut him down. I agree. I, the only time, and it kind of reminds me, I'm not saying this was going to happen, but like when Lemachenko um, fought in Orlando Salido, and if you get nasty in there, maybe a couple low blows, and then really bury your head in, he's got to do some really uh, uh, effective overhand rights and able to slow him down. I mean, he literally Valdez has got to make it. will make it fun. He'll he's he's got to be. He's got, that's his only yeah, shot. Yeah, sometimes Stevenson is so on point, there's no drama in the damn fight. Right. But the... The style of Valdez, that amateur pedigree, he's got good technique, he's got a good corner, but he just, no. I don't know, it just, just... Two things. Oh, I think of his last fight. It, the Brazilian... Well, look, that, that, there was a that, lot was, going on I know in his there was mind, a lot, though. but style-wise, that Brazilian gave him so much trouble, mm -hmm. and Shakur Stevenson is like an elite level of that Brazilian. If I'm Eddie Reynoso, I tell... Sh I tell my guy, there better be 100 rounds and rounds, one, two, and three, and it will work from there. But if you're going to go into a staring contest, I'm going to leave because we have no shot at that. Also, we talk about, or I just brought up, trainers need to win fights when they're not supposed to. Look, when you have Canelo Alvarez, you're going to win a lot of fights. If Eddie Reynoso can guide this guy to beat Shakur Stevenson, I'm going to start calling Eddie Reynoso Mexican Emmanuel Stewart. Yeah. I think it's going to be that much of a task. I'd give him that much credit, gentlemen. You guys yeah. are calling no, he'd him. He'd already be front runner for trainer yes. of the year. You guys are calling him Yoda if he's yes. able to pull that off. That's some Jedi stuff right and what there. What did Yoda <laughs> say? There is no try. There is just do. Yeah. Yeah. I haven't seen that in a while. Anyway, um, <laughs> this is interesting. Doug, you actually brought a copy, a generic version, still very valuable. Well, it's oh, a real ring, ring belt. belt. It's just not sure personalized. That over there to the nobody's, nobody's name is on it. I love it. I love the ribbon. So this will be uh, this will be in uh, San Antonio when Marlon Esparza fights Fujioka. That's okay. a, a, a flyweight unification bout. Oh. And they're number one and number two in the women's ring magazine flyweight ranking. So the inaugural women's ring magazine flyweight championship belt so you know what grabs. speaking That's of women's, april 9 san antonio so speaking of women's boxing a rematch yeah. between the winner of that fight or if it's sinistia Estrada against marlon esparza yeah. which is a real grudge match i'd be interested in that they i would like actually be interested in they that hate too. each other the no i know i like that fight i'm happy that female boxing is starting to get some momentum much like the females in the ufc yeah and props mm. to the zone for, for pushing women's boxing as much as, as it does. Eddie Hearn for pushing women's boxing. Golden Boy Promotions as well. They have Esparza yep. and Estrada. And you're right. That rematch would be a big deal. Yeah, and that'd a be a huge good fight. opportunity for Sinisa. Because if she were to beat Marlene again, that would make her a three-division champion. She would go right up those pound-for-pound yeah. pound How close rankings. was that first fight again? Pretty close. But it was close. It was bloody. That's what I remember. Yeah, that's what I remember. I remember the black camera how close it was. But <laughs> I, I think Sunisha clearly won an entertaining yeah. fight. That's the best way but to do it. But it was still competitive. Yeah. Uh, on your newsstands now, this is a personal favorite of mine. I don't know if anyone can see this. The Easton Assassin? The that's right. Larry Easton Assassin. Assassin. You All right, now, nickname. Yeah. Very good. What was the uh, genesis of this edition? You know what? We've done special issues recently on Marvelous Marvin Hagler. Um... The Untimely Demise of, of Cornell Whitaker, we did a special issue. Mm, I love those. And people loved them, and it was bittersweet because these fighters were gone. They, did, they, they didn't get to see this right. and hear all of the appreciation for their, their careers. Give them their, their flowers their now. Legend. Give it to them now. Yeah. Let's appreciate these guys while exactly. they're still around. As they... and, and here's the thing. 
Larry was underappreciated Absolutely. during his championship Well, he run. came under the heels, or on the heels of Ali, of course, but right. he quietly had, what, a 10-year run? Yes. Seven seven years. From 1978 well, to 1985. It felt, that it yeah. felt like a good 10 years, but yes. Yeah. yeah, well, he was still around in 88. He sure. challenged Mike Tyson. Right, exactly. And then he made a comeback in, like, 1990 or 91 and, and beat Ray Mercer. Yeah. One of, my point being, one Sadly, of Sadly, that's when I finally appreciated yeah. it. Right, right, right. <laughs> but so right. But what I'm not alone. He gave Holyfield a decent. Fight. He did. One yeah. of the more successful runs in the heavyweight division, though. If you all time if, if great, all He's time top five. One of the best jazz I ever. Too. Put, I would only put Muhammad Ali, Joe Lewis, and maybe Jack Johnson ahead of of the great Larry Holmes. Wow. Mm -hmm. I put him ahead of Rocky Marciano. As a child of the '80s, Larry Holmes stands out as like I remember when he fought Randall Tex Cobb on ABC and that fight's famous because right in the middle Howard Cosell was so disgusted by that fight in boxing <laughs> he literally I can't do this anymore I'm sick of this game and so he basically said F you boxing I'm out of here so years later Randall Tex Cobb becomes an actor and he's on the he's, he's with Johnny Carson it's on the Tonight character. Show yeah. and Johnny Carson goes geez you know your fight with Larry Holmes uh, he was so one sided that Howard Cosell quit boxing, and Randall Cobb goes, well, I'd go another 15 if he'd quit football. Oh, <laughs> yeah, that yeah, could yeah. be the best comeback right. ever. Right. Oh, yeah. and, and the other thing was, uh, was Larry, like Larry Holmes, I remember I was in uh, Placerita Junior High in Valencia, California. It was on a Thursday night, I believe, or weeknight. He fought Carl the Truth Williams in the last heavyweight championship that was on network TV. Controversial decision. I remember seeing him on network yeah, TV. 15 that, rounds. That's yeah. the first, like, as a kid, I think it was 15 yes, presence it was. that I used to see on TV with Larry Holmes. I, it felt like 10 years. It felt like he was the he was the champion all through my youth. <laughs> and you know, another thing that he said that was really funny, when ESPN back then would really cover boxing, it was a young Jim Gray was covering the Marciano Holmes fight for ESPN. So he finally loses that fight. Uh, it was his first loss, so he doesn't get to the 49-0. and 0. Jim Gray's hosting on ESPN. He goes, okay, let's throw it up to Richie Giacchetti and Larry Holmes. And Larry <laughs> Holmes had one of the great comments of all time. He sees Peter Marciano, the brother of Rocky, that was there. It, this, this thing was a big racial issue. Yeah. And Larry, being as honest as he could be, says, flat out, man. Rocky Marciano couldn't carry my jock strap. And you could hear people, oh, my God. Well, that, you could see Richie go, oh, God. Oh, Richie's no. like, Larry, Larry, come on. <laughs> yeah, you got, but, yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And, and Holmes goes, no, really, no, Richie? No, 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 really, <laughs> you know it's true. He says, yeah, really, Richie? You, yeah. you, you know it is It is true, though. Rocky Marciano was, I don't even know. Well, wow. no. Well, no, because Mario, if you're, if you're go to two different weight classes you know, well, That's what I was going to say. I mean, if you're being honest. Rocky he was never weighed over 190. It's exact. I think he was 183. And he was prone to cuts. Oh, no. Oh, he was in shape at 185. Yeah, yeah, that's what I'm saying. He was about 185, about 5'10", 5 5'11", 5 yeah. at the best. Yeah. Five, that's not even weight. That's a, a, a cruiserweight. That's not even... So that's what I'm saying. That's why he's not wrong about that. It's just because of the physical uh, mm -hmm. disparity. Not to discredit Marciano or style. I love The Rock. Yeah. But just... He wasn't really a legitimate heavyweight. Holmes you would know, have been he, all wrong for the round. Oh, yeah. all wrong. Come on. So you mentioned the racing. I'll never forget, too, when the Larry Holmes-Jerry Cooney Ooh, fight. 1982. Yeah, yeah, that was, and I was a little yeah, we kid. We talk a lot about that in this magazine. Oh, that in fact, was, the foreword yes. is written by Jerry Cooney. They made that a very big black white thing, right? Yeah. I, Neither fighter John, liked that. Neither fighter was. With no, that. right. And they're both, and Jerry Cooney. Unfair to them. Totally, totally unfair guy, to them. Great guy, Jerry. Jerry's yeah. a great guy. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. Great guy. And so he wasn't, didn't play into all that, but that, and they're. There effort it was. to sell People tickets and what have you. Was ugly. As yeah. this great technician, which he was, but his 15 round. Title winning fight against Ken Norton's one of the five greatest heavyweight fights of all time, especially the yeah. last 30 seconds. Yeah, maybe one of the top three final rounds yeah. of a heavyweight championship wow. fight. I like me some that Ken Norton in San Diego. Doug, oh, yeah. yeah, Doug Krikorian, who covered all those fights for the Long Beach Press Telegram, Herald Examiner, told me he was ringside for many of Holmes' fights. He said when Ernie Shavers popped Larry Holmes for seven seconds, Ernie Shavers was the rematch. heavyweight champion. Yep. And it was the hardest right hand Doug Krikorian ever felt from ringside. He said you could like hear the vibrations of the right hand. Oof. Also, um, you take a look at the Cooney Holmes fight. That was actually an action packed back and forth. It was. Controlled by Cooney Holmes. Was Caesar's Cooney was outside, attacking the body and the cup. Yeah. <laughs> and then yeah. Holmes had to get through that. Holmes got dropped by Ronaldo Snipes. Yes. He got hurt and pushed to the limit by a young Tim Witherspoon. He would gut it out. He wasn't just. A, a, a brilliant jab and skill and ring savvy. He had champions medal. Yeah, and Mario, he, was, and he was a warrior. No, he, he, he really was. And then another visual that I remember about Holmes too. Didn't he fight Butterbean? 
And yeah, he won. For the <laughs> honor of boxing. <laughs> he, he stood up for the honor oh, of boxing. Oh, yeah. Bob Butterbean. Well, it was the first time or the only time I saw Butterbean not in a four-rounder. Yeah. It was a ten-rounder. That's right. That's right. And Butterbean Mario, hung talk, tough. Mario, you talk about the Eastern Assassin. And what I love about Larry, he's not a sad story. He actually bought a lot of property. Oh, yeah. Bought businesses, created his own. Love to hear that. He would yeah. say, he'd say all the time, yeah, Don King rips me off, but he still pays me better than anyone else. So I kind of <laughs> live with it. The other thing, he was so blunt. This is during the 87, 88 era. They once asked him, what do you think of Mike Tyson? And he had no filter. He said, oh, one day he's going to be in jail. He's yeah. like, he's a criminal, basically. Is that what he said? Yeah. He, he said? He said, I'm still going down as, a, as, a, as an all-time great. He's going down as an SOB. Wow. He was a salty bastard. Yeah. He was just salty. That's just because, no, listen. By the end of the 80s, he was just, there was just so much venom, so much resentment for right. not being appreciated. Sure. And now he's done and he's not knocked, knocked the F out by Mike Tyson. Right. And it's like, he kind of had the misfortune of being in Ali's shadow and sort of being like the in between these two super popular, all time popular celebrity heavyweight champions, right. Ali and Mike Tyson. That's and true. he's just like, no one's ever going to talk about me. Yeah, and Doug, but you know that's what? some unfortunate timing. No, but, but you know what? Time heals all wounds. It's exactly. He, he's, he's, he's softened a little bit, sure. and, and people appreciate him now. And nice. Doug, finally, uh, you guys are doing something. It's an update. 100 greatest punchers. That's, that's going to be the, the next latest. issue. We just finished oh, it on wait. Friday. 100. Yeah, in 2003, Ring Magazine had an annual called the 100 greatest punchers of all time. We updated that list. What we did was we limited it to just the last 100 years because we're celebrating our 100-year anniversary. So it's the greatest punchers from 1922 to the present. And on the cover, it's all like punchers who have emerged in the last 20 or 30 years. Got it. So you got like Deontay Wilder mm. on a big picture, knocking out, uh, he's knocking out, uh, who's that guy? Uh, Dominic Brazil. Brazil. Oh, yeah. That was a that scary was a one, right? Yeah. One. So you got, we got... Um, Deontay Wilder, we got Gennady Golovkin, we got Niowa Inouye, we got Tank Davis on the cover. Do you break them down and by so what's the what's the criteria? Like obviously with weight, punching prowess, and there's different types of there's there's your your um, the guy who wrote the foreword is is the Hawk Julian Jackson. Oh yeah, there's the one hitter quitter puncher. You got punchers like Archie Moore. You got the accumulation punchers. Sure. You got the, the the combination specialists like Mike Tyson. Got it. You got the guys who just wear you down like Julio Cesar Chavez. Sure. It's different types Heavy of punchers. Handed. Yes, different, there is. And then you got, and then you got the one hitter quitters. Sure. I love those. That's yeah. that's Ernie Shavers. That's that's the Hawk. That's the Hitman at his best. Right. Those guys are very highly rated too. You're right. If you have the one hitter quitter, you you, you rated a little higher than the accumulation cats, but. If the accumulation cats have a ton of knockouts or won most of their fights by knockouts, sure. they're highly ranked too. So how yeah. would you judge a Vladimir and Vitaly Klitschko? Are they in there? Because by At least one of them is. Okay. You gotta right. buy it. You gotta spoiler buy the spoiler alert. <laughs> spoiler yeah, 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 yeah. alert. No, there's a, there's there's some recent heavyweights in there. And mm. even Anthony Joshua's in there. And he's not a one hitter quitter generally. He has to wear you down. The way he's, he's not high on the list, but he cracked the yeah. one hundred. Huh. The, the way he's built, you would think he would be, yeah. but ironically. But Deontay, he's not. Oh yeah, no, that's a one. You know Deontay's at least top thirty, right? He should be top higher, 20? really, statistically. Top 10? And is the bronze bomber? You, you'll and, and, have and to buy heavy, the... You'll have to buy... No, you'll have to buy, but I'm saying if you're judging by there. heavyweight standards... It says it right on the cover, too. We have the numbers on the cover, so we kind of spoil it for ourselves. I put them top 10 by heavyweight standards. I mean, you got to. Mm. He's at least... Oh, in heavyweights, yeah. That's what but I'm I mean, talking about. But this is all time. Got it, got it, got all got weight classes. Sure. Maybe, arguably, yes, top 20. All right. Well, look, Doug, as always, please visit it, uh, visit us again. Uh, programming reminder, next week we are off, but we're going to come back. The following week, we're going to review Spence Ugas. We're going to have a lot to talk about yeah, as you will. get back from Nashville. So on behalf of Doug Fisher, Mario Lopez, Tim Frazier, Justin Buffalo Knuckles, and Tino, Tino on the edits, this is Steve Kim saying goodbye, everybody.